I would invite your attention this morning, if such a thing can be done, to the book of Zechariah. So take a few seconds to find that. It's Old Testament. Right before the end, right before Malachi, you'll find the book of Zechariah, chapter number 9. For those that can, let's stand and read a few verses of Scripture together. We're going to begin in verse number 9 of Zechariah, chapter number 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Father, we pray that you'd be with us this morning as we meet together. We thank you that, uh, that your strength is made perfect in weakness, and we'd ask today, Lord, that you would look down upon us and that you would bless us for being here, that you would uh, lift us up, that you would draw us to yourself, that we might see the great and mighty things that you have done and that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for all the things that you've done for us. We pray that you'd be with the remainder of the message today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. First of all, I want to say that... Um, between now and the, and the end of the year, see, I feel like a visiting preacher already. Um, between now and the, uh, and the end of the year, uh, we'll complete the, hopefully we will complete the, what is known as the transition process. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for, um, at least up to now, uh, having made that so easy. Um, as far as I know, and if this is not the case, don't tell me. As far as I know, uh, everything is going well, uh, and everybody seems to be praying for the transition and accepting uh, the things that are going on, and we uh, appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure that looking forward, looking ahead, uh, we will appreciate it even more. There are those who say that this will never work. Don't believe them. This will work. Um, here we have in the book of Zechariah, and I want you to uh, just turn over to the right in your Bibles just a few pages to Matthew chapter number 21 in case there is any doubt as to what this is uh, talking about or referring to. Matthew chapter number 21 and verse number 5 says, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt the foal of an ass. Now, does that sound familiar? Sounds pretty much like what we just read, does it not? So this, in the Old Testament, which is, is many times the case, looks ahead to things that are fulfilled in the New Testament, and the New Testament quotes, in many occasions, the Old Testament prophecies to show that these are being fulfilled. So here we have Christ given to us in the Old Testament as the federal head uh, of his people, of his redeemed, was crucified, shed his blood, went to the grave for our sins, and was raised again for our justification. This is all given to us in the Old Testament. This is why when Paul wrote to Timothy, he could say, uh, you've known the scriptures that were able to make you wise unto salvation. What scriptures was it that Timothy knew? He knew the Old Testament. Amen? Amen. This all fits together. You can't take the Old Testament away uh, from the Bible because everything in there points toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know there are people who, who make a living out of taking verses and picking out verses in the Old Testament and say, well, this, you know, if this is true, this contradicts this verse in the New Testament. That's only because of our feeble misunderstandings that it does that. There is no 
contradiction in the Word of God. And if we're going to study the Word of God, then the Word of God has to be the standard by which those things are judged. Amen. Otherwise, there is no sense in studying the Word of God. If we can sit down and, and study the Bible, and then when we get together, we can say, well, uh, you know, I don't believe that Paul, I don't believe that this is Scripture when Paul said this over here. Then your, your basis for argument and for discussion and for learning is gone. You have no basis to work with. So here we have Zechariah in the Old Testament looking ahead to the Messiah and looking for deliverance. And so he says, to rejoice greatly, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having what? Salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of an ass. And he says, as for thee also, verse 11, by the blood of thy covenant I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. So this means that we have the opportunity to be delivered by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this means that there is deliverance to be had with Christ because Christ was the first one delivered. Amen? He was the first fruits of them that slept. You don't believe that? Well, turn in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number... 15, <clears throat> verse number 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, of all men, most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become, what? The first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So here we have Christ as the firstfruits of them that slept. The, uh, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the one that was to come, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. All right? And so if he's the same yesterday, he's the same through all the yesterdays. All the yesterdays. And before there was time, there weren't any yesterdays. Amen? I mean, the, the, the word Jehovah uh, in, in the Jewish means the always existing one. Right? Always existing one. So when God looks at this whole thing, he is. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right? And he doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So even before time was, we see here that the plan was that Christ would be the first fruits of them that slept. The same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Christ is the first, the first fruits, then that kind of implies that there must be other fruits, does it not? So if there are some first fruits, there are going to be some other fruits. This blood of the covenant, as the Lord himself calls it here, and calls it in the New Testament, and we may look there uh, in a minute, had to fulfill the requirements of the covenant. And the covenant, a covenant, always has requirements every covenant that god has ever made with mankind has been broken by who mankind <laughs> because we're good at that now if there's one thing we're good at it's not keeping our word we're good at sin we're good at rebellion we're good at saying we'll do one thing and do something else and if you believe that you can keep your salvation by making a promise to God that you'll never sin again, wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Amen? I mean, even John, who might have been a little bit more spiritual than you and I, said, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. <clears throat> Nothing like being straightforward, you know. Well, John was about 100 years old at the time. He, 
you know, he's going to say what he thinks, amen. The older you get, the more you say what you think. That's kind of how it happens. So we find that this, this requirement of the covenant had something, had some, some reasons for existence and had some uh, determinations to make and had some expectations, which was to produce something, which was fruit. Christ was the first fruits, but there are going to be other fruits. Book of John, chapter number 15. We're running a, a few verses of Scripture this morning to get started. <clears throat> Just to lay a little bit of foundation. But the Lord here, chapter 15, verse number 1, he says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. That sounds to me like there's no middle ground. I mean, there's no in-between. I mean, we're either going to bring forth some sort of fruit or we're going to be taken away. I don't believe that necessarily means lost. I just mean it means taken away. I mean, if you're not going to do anything that's decent, then the Lord, you know, why cumbereth it the ground? So the Lord can do what he wants to with his own. Amen? And how many are his own? <clears throat> Everybody. Everybody is his own. And so in, in, uh, here we have the fact that there is fruit. There's supposed to be fruit. In uh, Romans chapter number 7, we will see, maybe, Verse number 4 of Romans chapter 7 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. There's the covenant. There's the picture of the covenant. Dead to the law by the body of Christ. This blood, Jesus said, is the blood of the New Testament, our covenant. Amen? So, <clears throat> wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth what? Fruit unto God. So the purpose of the covenant then was not just to send Christ to die and that be the end of it and nothing else ever happen. The purpose of the covenant was to send Christ to die, raise him as the first fruits, and then there will be other fruits. And there will continue to be fruit until the father turns to the son and says, I've had enough of this. Go back and get them. Amen. 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 That's how it's going to play out. That's how it's going to happen. So the purpose of the blood covenant then was to set men free so that we could produce things. So we could be productive. Because you can't be productive if you're not free. You can't be productive if there's not something within you that will produce something. Amen? Otherwise, you're dead if there's nothing in you, right? What is this whole thing about the Spirit of God that is within you? That's supposed to be doing what? Producing fruit. You may have heard of the fruit of the Spirit. You know, that's the kind of fruit, amen? We're supposed to produce spiritual fruit. We should produce, we should reproduce and produce other fruit. So the purpose of the blood covenant was to set men free. Set them, fr set them free from, as the text says in Zechariah, set them free from the pit. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, so that's the method, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. So, as the text says, the covenant, the blood of the covenant, will set you free. And if your God sets you free, you are free indeed. Amen? Now, people talk about having a free will, but the problem with free will is that it's your will. It's not God's will. And your will, irrespective of what you think about your will, and when you make decisions, you think, I'm doing this of my own free will, but you're not. 
because your will is tainted. Without the Spirit of God, your will is going to do the wrong thing. It's going to make the wrong choices. It's going to be all tangled up with that heart which is deceitful and desperately wicked, and who can know it? So that's where the, the will of mankind gets them, and you don't have to look far around the world today to see that. That's where free will will get you. It will get you in free trouble. Amen? We don't really need free will. We need God's will. And the only way to get that is through the blood of the covenant. So we need to be set free, as the text says, from the pit. All of God's people and everybody else were once, at least, in the pit. Amen? There is none that doeth righteousness. There is none that seeketh after God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the picture is that they are in the pit, and the blood of the covenant can set them free from the pit. So positionally speaking, and speaking as a human trapped in time, each one of us was or is in the pit. Now God is above time, so he knows how it's all going to turn out, but you and I do not. So when we argue about theological positions that we do not understand, part of the reason we do not understand them is because we try to argue God's positions from our viewpoint. And we will never understand if we do that. We need to see God's viewpoint. Does God see the end from the beginning? Is God the end from the beginning? Is Christ the end from the beginning? Amen. Scripture says as much, right? So he, he knows all of that. We're not questioning what God knows, but there's a lot of things that we don't know. And we would be well advised to at least learn some of them. So positionally speaking, every one of us either was or still is in the pit. If we are not washed by the blood of the covenant, we are still in the pit. Even Zechariah said that, and this is Old Testament. By the blood of thy covenant, I have set forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein is no water. So if we're not washed by the blood, we are still in the pit. If we've been cleansed by the crimson flow of Christ's blood, then we have been delivered from the pit. And no matter what your theology, your likes or your dislikes, or your disposition to the things of God, we are all in one of those two places. Just one. Say, well, I'm working on it. You won't get there. Because nothing will deliver you from the pit except the blood of the covenant. So that's what happens in pits. So we can make a little picture of the pit, if you like. We can, you, you know, in the book of Jeremiah, uh, there's a pretty good picture. Of, they said they let Jeremiah, Jeremiah was not well liked. Jerusalem and he spent a lot of time <clears throat> in pits and they would it says they would let him down into the pit now a pit was simply a hole in the ground that was dug there for one purpose basically well maybe two to dump trash in and to put people in so when they let him down in the pit that pit was specially prepared for him and it was prepared so that he could not, in and of himself, get himself out. You know, pits kind of, you just get the picture of a pit as being kind of slimy on the edges, you know, and you, you try to scratch your way up, and you might get like six inches off the deck, but then, you know, the slime just goes, and you just slide back down, and all you do is get dirty. And that's what people do who are trying to save themselves. That's right. They're just getting dirty. This is not working. There's only one way I can dig if I'm in a pit. I can dig down. That's not helping. I need to go up. I need to get out. I need somebody to help. There's no way out. Dirty, hungry, pathetic, left to die. No one cared for my soul. No one could provide a way out. And if you don't understand where you are, 
You might just think this is the way life is. And I've met people like that. And you probably have too. Well, you know, there's really no hell because this is hell right here. This is the worst it will ever get. Don't hold your breath. This may not be the worst it ever gets. I know people back in the 50s and 60s were saying the world can't get any worse. Some of those people are still alive and saying the world's gotten worse. And as time goes on, what does the Bible tell us? Evil men shall do what? Wax worse and worse. So is it going to get worse? The world, in the eyes of the world and the things of the world and the goals of the world and the priorities of the world, things are going to get worse. The only cure for that and the way to get out of the pit, the only cure for that is the blood of the covenant. And so... If we don't understand where we are, we'll think that maybe that's just the way it is and that's the way it will end. This is life. This is all there is. You've got to make the best of living in the pit. Yeah, and some people do that. You know, you can decorate your pit. You can go to the thrift store and find some nice curtains for your pit. Keep the pit all cleaned up as best you can. But at the, at, as, as they say now, at the end of the day, whichever day that is, it's still a pit. Amen? And we may try, <clears throat> you know, it's like all the self-help books. I'm not against self-help books, except most of them only help the person who wrote it. But we can try to help ourselves all we want to, and we're going to end up basically back in the same place. Because we have to live with us. The person who wrote the book only has to live with him. But we have to live with us, and we have to live with everybody else. But when you come to understand where you are, you will discover that that's miserable. Amen? I don't think that anybody that ever came to Christ thought it was great before they got there. Because if it was great before they got there, why come? You have to come to it somewhere along the line. To come to Christ, you come to an understanding that I am miserable. Have you ever been miserable? Are you miserable now? That's why we sang smile a lot. See, so you don't have to be miserable. You can smile. Some people smile when they're miserable. It's okay. That's better than frowning and spitting on people. And so it is with the condemned. Until we see ourselves as condemned and in the pit and no way out, until we see ourselves that way, we'll just think that that's the way it is. But you're in the pit. There's no way out. You've got to understand. Eventually, we must come to the understanding that we are in the pit, we are condemned to this existence, and there seems to be no way out. You can be under conviction while you're in the pit and still not get out. And probably most of us who have spent any time trying to reason with people know people that were or still are in the pit and they think that's just the way it is that's the way it's going to be and they can be under conviction but that's not freedom anybody who's ever experienced conviction knows that it's not freedom amen all it is is conviction it's not freedom esau found no place for repentance even though he sought it with tears. He cried over his situation, but he could not within himself get himself to the place where he could turn and do the right thing or see the right perspective or come to the right conclusion. 
And that's where we'll be as long as we don't go to the blood. We'll stay there. Being miserable does not relieve you of your position. Only escape can do that. You may try to pray. I mean, after all, how many you know, hordes and hordes of lost people pray every day? Right? They pray for things they want. They, they pray that life will get better. They, you know, we're always... Any public place, even though there's supposed to be separation of church and state, any big thing that you go to that's sobbing over something, they're going to pray. I mean, half the time they don't know who they're praying to, but they're going to pray anyway. The president can declare a national day of prayer and mourning, and okay, it's a piece of paper. And some people will go to a little uh, breakfast or something, and somebody will lead in prayer. That doesn't mean you're praying. Even if you're the one leading the prayer, it doesn't mean you're praying. What we need is not prayer. What we need is escape. You may try to perform a few rites and rituals that will make you feel better about being in the pit. And all of that is great. I mean, we all have our little things and some religions have their things that they do you know you gotta it's I, I don't know if you can tell if you're in the pit though which way is east but you know you might have to face east or you might have to count rocks around your neck or you might have to do whatever it is you have to do but it, but at the end of it all you're still in the pit without the blood of the covenant you're still in the pit you may long for some company but you know what? The problem is you have your own pit. Yeah, you may talk to a few folks, around, but they're not in the same pit. They're in their own pit. And so sometimes our pits clash. And so we have differences of opinions. That's what politics is. It's just a clashing of pits. Right? Everybody's got a different opinion about about their circumstance. So the blood of the covenant facilitates the release of the prisoner. That's why it's there. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Because we need the blood of the covenant. The prisoner, it says, is sent forth. That's not something that the prisoner did. It doesn't say that the prisoner got up and pulled himself up by his bootstraps and went for it. It says he was sent forth. If you're going to be released from the pit and released from being a prisoner, somebody else is going to have to do that. Somebody with the power and authority to let you out is going to have to do that. Somebody with the grace to put you in a different position is going to have to do that. Someone who understands every facet about your heart and your personality is going to have to do that. The prisoner is sent forth. It was something that was done for him. The blood of the covenant was shed for him. And he is delivered on that basis. He's delivered on the basis of the blood. And that's the only basis that he's going to be delivered from is the basis of the blood. And everyone is going to have their own pit. You want to see the method, the basis of deliverance? Matthew chapter 26. Jesus at what we call the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. Matthew 26 and verse 27 says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my what? This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of, of sins. What does that mean? 
What does it mean to have your sins remitted? Yeah, it means, it means that they're taken off the ledger. Remitted. When you send a bill, you ask for, please make remittance. Right? Please take this off the, I want to take it out of the owed column and put it in the paid column. Shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ says, my blood, Christ's blood. Now, since we're talking here in the book of Zechariah about what we have already determined by looking at the New Testament was, in fact, the Messiah, we're talking about the Messiah's blood, Christ's blood, the blood of the new covenant. And you and I, in order to be free from this pit that we are in, must be released by this blood. Jesus said, unless you eat of my flesh and, and drink of my blood, I have no part in you. Amen? So the blood is the remitting part of the covenant. You must partake of this blood. How do you do that? You do that by faith. Salvation is by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You must partake of his blood by faith. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the only way to get peace with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way that he provided for that was by the shedding of his blood as he told them when he set up the Lord's Supper. The release of the prisoner now is legal. The price was paid. The, the covenant price, there's a covenant price. You know, many times in the Old Testament, they'll say, if you want to redeem, they use the word redemption most of the time in the Old Testament. If you want to redeem your slave, this is what it will cost you. If you want to redeem your land, this is what it will cost you. There's always a price. The word redemption implies that there is a price. And in this case, the price was paid. It was paid by the Messiah from the words of his own mouth. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant or the new testament. So the price was paid. That means that we did not escape if you were saved this morning, you did not escape from the pit. You were released from the pit. You were brought out of the pit. You were taken out of the miry clay and set on the solid rock. And so if you come by the blood of the covenant, you have a right to be out. Not because of what you did, but because of what was done on your behalf by somebody else who loved you and shed his blood for you so that you could have redemption. God has sent the prisoners forth. You know, if the prisoners are sent forth, they will not return. They're not going to return to the pit. They've been released. How many times do you have to get released from the pit? It's one time. That's what the New Testament says, amen? Once for all. Just one time. It's not your strength that's going to free you. It's not your knowledge that's going to free you, although there are some who would like to believe that. I don't know enough to figure out how Christ's blood was shed and applied to me. I don't know enough to figure that out. But I accept this. I accept the fact that Christ said that it happened. Amen. And that Christ said that if I, by faith, by repentance and faith, come to him, that it happens to me. And that's the faith that we need. 
I'm not strong enough to do that. You're not strong enough to do that. I don't know enough to do that. All I know and have knowledge of is where I am right now. And that's really all you know is where you are right now. Sometimes we think surely he would not want me. That's not the point. The point is Christ's blood was shed for you. That's an obvious indication that he wants you. Amen. Amen. You don't die for somebody you don't want. It's for you if you want it. You say, well, what if Christ doesn't want to give it to me? That's above your pay grade. You don't get to make that decision. He already said he shed his blood, and if you'll repent and trust him, you'll be saved. Sometimes Christ tells us what we need to know, and he doesn't have to go into great detail above that. We do that all by ourselves and confuse ourselves. It's for you if you want it. And if you want it and trust Christ, you can be sure that he'll do what he said he would do. And that the blood did what it said it would do. There are some who would say, well, what if I'm not one of the elect? Well, let me ask you this. <clears throat> Were you elected to the pit? Well, not really. Everybody's born into that, right? You don't, you don't have to be elected to that. It is true, too, that God chooses. But while you're lost, that's above your pay grade. What you need to understand is this. Christ died for sinners, and you are one. That's it. Christ died for sinners, you are one. So what do you need to do? All you need to do is trust Christ. And the blood of the covenant is shed for you. God saw the blood of the Passover. And because of that, delivered. You say, well, the people themselves did that. No, God told them to do that. Remember, isn't that what happened? The people themselves just didn't decide to take up the blood with with the, and strike it on the doorpost. Who told him to do that? God told him to do that. Why did he tell him to do that? To save them. God told his people to do that, to save them. Now, you getting the picture? If God told his people to do that, to save them, and he has told you to repent of your sins and trust Christ, then you'll be one of his. Amen. Amen. It's the same. It's the same deal. God doesn't give false invitations. He doesn't give fake commands. He doesn't command you to repent and then not allow you to do so. He does what he said he would do. God saw the blood of the Passover and delivered. God saw the blood of the covenant and and delivered. And as Elijah says in the Sunday school lesson this morning, why halt ye between two opinions? Or two thoughts? If Baal be God, serve him. But if God be God, serve him. Just do what he says. If God be God, he can deliver. How is he going to deliver? He's going to deliver by the blood of the covenant, as he has said. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein is no water. There's deliverance with the blood of Christ. Amen? It can be applied to you simply on your reaching out to God and saying, I need 
salvation. I need deliverance. I can't do it. I can think about it. I can study about it. I can take positions on it. I can cry over it. But I need the repentance that only comes by understanding the price that was paid for my sin. And that price was the blood. And God said that he would apply it. Amen? Just like the Passover, that he would apply it. You need the blood this morning? It's there. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's still there. Christ went and suffered on the cross, took that blood to the heavenly tabernacle, applied it. The atonement has already been made. What you need is reconciliation to the atonement that's made. And that offer will stand until the Lord comes back. Or until you leave this planet. Then it's not good anymore. I know none of us are planning to leave this planet anytime soon, but you know what? You just never know. You just never know. Those five kids at the school in Tahlequah didn't plan to leave the planet. But they did. So we need the blood of the covenant applied to my heart to save me from sin and myself. Amen. Let's all stand. Brother Adam, you come. Lead us in a verse of <clears throat> invitation. If you have a need this morning, you might come and tell the Lord about it.